Today's video is brought to you by Surfshark. Safety and security online are critically important and you can, well, stay safe online with Surfshark, can't you? More on them in a bit. Just before we get to the video that you actually came here to watch, let me tell you about a new channel that I'm running called Decoding the Unknown. It's a show where I take a long, deep dive into some of the world's biggest mysteries, from what happened to the Roanoke colonists to the regular guy who found a listening device in his power strip. It's absolutely terrifying, and it's always a bit of a wild ride. You can find a link below. I hope to see you over there. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. This one today, I don't know why I feel like I'm about to break into a sponsory, but that's not what we do here. <laughs> Simon, get it together. It's very early in the morning. I'm starting this one early. Uh, this one's all about the craze. Mythical Beasts of Clubland, brought to you. Again, this isn't a sponsor to read. I'm just saying it's written by Chris. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm going to read it if you're new here. What happens is Chris has written me something that I've not read before. Although, of course, as a British person, I am familiar with the craze. In fact, I have a craze story. Um, don't. It's like, Simon, isn't this not your generation? I'm like, no, it's not my generation. I've never met the craze. But uh, I do have a story, which I'll tell in just a moment. First of all, thank you to Chris for writing it. I've never read it before. I'm going to read it. We're going to explore it together. And of course, also thank you to Jen. Well, hello, beautiful. Wonderful video editor on this channel. And of course, thank you to you for watching or listening. However you consume this show. If you are listening, it also comes out as a podcast. And I love those reviews. My Cray story. And I wasn't sure about this. Like, it was vaguely in my mind. But I remember growing up and my nan lived on this street. And in this house, obviously, as people are wont to do. And her neighbor, there was this crazy car outside. It wasn't, you know, not like a Ferrari or something. But it was this, like, crazy American car. Like, 19, like, that 1960s vibe. It had all these weird, like, it kind of looked like a rocket ship. It sort of had these weird pointy bits at the back. The lights were all crazy. There was tons of chrome. It was ugly as anything, thinking about it now. But, like, back in the day as a kid, I was fascinated by this. And I was fascinated, like, Nan, who lives next to you? Who is the person who has this crazy car? And I feel like there was maybe more than one and stuff. It was very, it was very only occasionally parked out there. And uh, my nan was like, well, that's uh, Mrs. Cray. And I'm like, I didn't know who the Crays were. I was like a kid. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And she's like, they were these London gangsters. And this is uh, one of their ex-wives. Or they're one of, one of the Cray's ex-wives. And I'm like, all right. Didn't think about it for years. Uh, Chris was writing to me about, do you want to do the Crays? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And then I was like, wait a minute. I vaguely remember something about the Crays. So I look up the Crays on Wikipedia. And then I look up their wives, and I'm like, oh my god, my nan was right in the woman's Wikipedia page. Uh, her name's like, I think it will be mentioned in here, like Kate Howard. She was my nan's neighbor. And I'm like, it's on the Wikipedia page. And I'm like, that's nuts. That's nuts. My nan doesn't live there anymore. So, because she's dead. And of course, she will testify. She's dead. That's so sad. But uh, <laughs> she also moved before she died. It, not important. But she used to live next to ex Mrs. Cray. I'm like, holy shit. This was just into like random village in the Kent countryside. Let us continue. I mean, begin. Sorry, this has been a long introduction. But cool that. Normally I'm like, Simon, why are you telling these boring stories? I like this story. It's the 9th of March, 1966, a quiet Wednesday night at the Blind Beggar in Whitechapel, London. A legend says it was named for Henry de Montfort, brother of the famous Simon de Montfort. Not Whistler, that is. I don't think anyone was confused. Who was said to have posed as a blind beggar in order to escape detection after the Battle of Evesham. An inner pub has stood on this spot since the late 1600s, and it's always been a refuge for pickpockets, outlaws, and murderers. There's no jukebox, so a lone barmaid is putting The Sun Ain't Gonna Shine Anymore by the Walker Brothers on the pub's record player. Over in the corner, this man is late 70s nursing a pint and glancing every now and then at the television. Seated at a table are three men, George Cornell, Albie Woods, and Johnny Dale. The Cornell's a member of the feared Richardson gang, and his companions are friends of his. I get the feeling this is one of those pubs. Do you ever walk into a pub? Like, I don't know, you're in a new place, you're traveling or you're visiting or whatever, or you're on a drive somewhere and you have to stop for lunch. And you walk in and you just don't feel welcome. He doesn't like you. I'm sorry. Because <laughs> you're not a member of a gang. Everyone there is, or everyone there is just more likely just a local. And they're like, who the f is this guy in our pub? <laughs> and you're always like, hello, hello, okay. Ah. 
sometimes don't like that and they're just like no 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 i don't i, was, I just wanted to look inside and now i am leaving <laughs> At about half past eight, two men walk in, one tall, square jaw and heavy set, the other an overweight, dark haired man in horn rimmed spectacles. The square jaw one pulls out a pistol and fires two shots into the ceiling. Cornell's friends, Woods and Dale, hastily wipe their prints off tabletops and beer glasses before darting into the bathrooms to hide. Cornell himself turns to face the bespectacled man. <laughs> the bespectacled man exclaims, That escalated quickly. No, he didn't, he said. Well, look who's here, he said sarcastically. The bespectacled man pulled a 9mm Mauser pistol from his pocket and shoots him in the head. Holy sh**. <laughs> this escalated super quickly. Cornell and like 9mm are not normal guns to be had in the UK. I've never held a handgun in the UK. Like outside of like a handgun air pistol. Because we just don't have those. They're just not something that you can get as a regular person as far as I'm aware. You can get a shotgun. You can get a rifle. What about our bazooka team? Um... The handguns are like a big no-no. Cornell slumps forward. The two men leave. Cornell is rushed across the road to the London hospital, but he dies of his head wound two hours later. The man in the spectacles was Ronnie Cray, one half of the iconic ganglands pair known as the Crays. The other man was his right-hand man, Ian Barry. Despite the blatant nature of the crime and the presence of witnesses, it's more than two years before anyone's even charged. What senior investigating officer Detective Superintendent Leonard nipper reed would later come up against was the famous east east end code of silence a kind of cockney murder where a man could literally stab another man in the eye in front of a crowd of witnesses and all anyone would say was i never saw nothing yeah if i was in that pub i'm not if just having my lunch just traveling through and i saw that i'd be like i don't know anything <laughs> police would interview me i'd have no idea what's going on but i was like then nothing happened i was just in there quietly hurting my here enjoying my lunch i heard a bang Thought someone maybe dropped a pan, and that I finished my lunch and left, never to return. And no, I definitely didn't see anyone got shot. And no, the reason I'm going into therapy is not because of that. <laughs> because you just assume you're going to get murdered if you say something, right? Ooh, there's a note here from Chris. This refers to Bulldog Wallace, who famously killed a Jewish man by stabbing him in the eye with the tip of an umbrella at the Blinds Beggar. He was arrested, but no witnesses could be found to testify, all saying, I never saw nothing. He was carried back in triumph to the beggar to continue drinking this happens in the early 1900s this is a place you don't want to go if you're not a criminal because you're like if i get murdered there's a good, there's no re you could be murdered in there and it'd be fine like no one would get in trouble don't go to those places it's like bad parts of town just don't go there just you're increasing your chances of getting murdered i'm afraid i have no money and if you have to go there i'm, I'm sorry <laughs> i was like come up with some useful advice i got nothing i don't even know why i said this at least this is one version of the story. According to Nipper Reed, there were 32 people in the pub that night, and they either melted away or became temporarily blind when the craze walked in, and it was a Luger, not a Mauser. Herein lies the problem. The craze were a self-conscious pop culture phenomenon even while they were operating, which means that every story is embellished, disputed, or possibly just made up. They've had highly sympathetic representations from the likes of Spandu Ballet and Tom Hardy, multiple telly movies and cash-in books have been written by and about them, and celebrities of the time looking for a bit of cool criminal cash or but endorsing their activities. There's references to them in many classic gangster films as well, and a weekly tour starting at The Blind Beggar is led by Stephen Marcus, the actor who played Nick the Greek in Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. The Craze are practically a commercial enterprise, and much of the viability of this business rests on the false narrative that they were the gods of crime and dark public benefactors. But were they really? It's hard to stay, say because the truth, even down to the level of basic facts, is an early and frequent casualty of any attempt to build a legend. I'm amazed. Is the blind beggar? It's still like an open pub where they now do tours from. That's kind of intense. I've got to look this up on Google Maps. Give me a sec. Let's see what people review about it. The blind beggar. Oh, I'm not getting any results. Am I misspelling beggar? Is that with an A or an E? Oh, no, I got it right. Whitechapel. Bingo. <laughs> Fantastic pub with a rich history. <laughs> I guess like this was so long ago this yeah there's a place called Le Madison Steakhouse coffee houses there's a lot I, I guess this part of London might have become slightly gentrified and now it's a pub with what 4.1 stars fantastic pub with a rich history nice cozy, cozy pub with a big sleepy cat <laughs> 42 people mentioned the cat <laughs> okay 100 people mentioned history oh Google we love you
in the cradle of Bill Sykes and Sweeney Todd. At around 8 p.m. on Tuesday, the 24th of October, Violet K. Cray gave birth to the Crays. Reggie came first and Ronnie about 10 minutes later. The oldest child of this family was a boy called Charles, six years old when the twins were born. There had been a sister as well, but she died in infancy. Violet was of Romani extraction, vulgarly referred to as gypsies, and Charles, their father, was Irish. Dad was a traveling salesman known colloquially as Pestera, who would roam the countryside buying and selling clothing, gold and silver, or anything else he might have found a demand for when he went on the knock. Yeah, I think you could uh, refer to any salesman as a pesterer. Their paternal grandfather, Big Jimmy Cray, was a stallholder in the Hoxton market, known for his hard drinking and his even harder pub brawling. Their maternal grandfather, Jimmy Lee, was a teetotaler, an extremely rare phenomenon in the East End of London or England at the time. He was a multi-talented man, a born athlete, a bare-knuckle boxer, who fought under the name The Southpaw Cannonball. Another note from Chris Southpaws fight in left-handed or goofy stance, with the right hand as the leading hand and the left the dominant. I don't know what a Southpaw is. Ah. I actually thought it was uh, an American way of calling left-handed people, but I guess not. As a musical entertainer, he was reportedly capable of licking white hot pokers, walking on bottle tops, tap dancing, and other musical staples. What's hard about walking on bottle tops? Even if they're the other way around, they're not that sharp. It's not like he's walking on nails or something. If all this sounds a bit Dickensian, that's not an accident. Where they lived in Hoxton, as well as Bethnal Green, where the family moved in 1939, was a sort of temporary anomaly, the last remnant of Dickens's dark old London. They were basically ghettos, especially the Bethnal Green house on Valance Road, chaotic cesspools of vice, illegal gambling, sly, grog, and prostitution. It's no surprise that Dickens planted the villain Bill Sykes in this very neighborhood, that Jack the Ripper killed one of his victims here, and that so many of the mystic figures of London crime, including Sweeney Todd, Note, a barber reputed to have murdered his patrons and sold their flesh in meat pies. I thought that was a fictional story. Wait, Sweeney Todd's not real? Was Sweeney Todd real? Oh, you're, you, you're confused. That's f***ed up. He'd be like, isn't there a musical? Hey, Sweeney Todd the barber, ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. All right! Why on earth do I remember that? <laughs> okay. During their early childhood, Ronnie and Reggie Cray saw even less of their itinerant father. It being World War II, he was on the run from conscription. Interestingly, they went to the same school as George Cornell, the man Ronnie shot in the blind beggar, and they were reputed to be childhood friends. Wasn't a good friend. Their elder brother Charlie was so into boxing that he and Grandpa Lee converted part of the family house into a gym. Taught them the art, but Charlie left for national service and fought as a welterweight for the Royal Navy. Under Grandad and Charlie's tutelage, Reggie and Ronnie went on to become prominent in schoolboy boxing, with Reggie winning a championship and Ronnie making the finals. They fought an exhibition match against each other as part of a traveling show which came to the East End, for which they were paid, and after this they would call themselves professional boxers. <laughs> okay. Many people look for clues to their future career in this period of their lives, citing the lack of male role models, despite the fact they had several strong ones, the doting permissiveness of their mother, which might be a factor, and the general deprivation of the East End at the time, which probably had something to do with it. Yeah, I mean, okay, so they were brought up in a rough environment where there seemed to be... I mean, well, did we mention there's lots of crime? I feel like there'd be crime going on around them, and they're like, you know what makes money? Crime. They say crime doesn't pay. It absolutely does, or there would be no crime. And I think these boys probably saw it and were like, let's get into crime. <laughs> I guess we'll find out. In reality, though, the thing which really marked them out was their propensity to violence, a theme which was to carry on throughout their lives, and there was the fact of them being identical twins. Castor and Pollux, Romulus and Remus, the hero twins of Central and South American civilizations, mythic twins are a perennial feature of human social memory, and their twinhood was often commented on and was almost certainly a factor in the creation of the Cray mythos. Once the boys left school at 15, they worked odd jobs at the Billingsgate fish market until it was time for them to do their national service. This was a mandatory two-year enlistment for males over 18 years of age, which endured in Britain until 1960. Whoa! I had no idea. We had national service in the UK until night. So my grandparents would, or my, they'd have had to do national service. My granddad's died before I was born, so I never really got to know them. And my uh, grandma's never talked about them, so I know nothing about them, which is kind of sad, I guess. So they must have had to do that. That's so intense. Wow. They were reported to the Royal Fusiliers at the Tower of London, but didn't even get past the entry process, with Ronnie seriously injuring a corporal who tried to stop them from leaving. <laughs> Once it's like, how are we going to leave? Well, we're going to punch that corporal in the face and leave. 
And then the corporal's like, no, you're not. I'm going to stop you. They punch him in the face. And then it's like, well, you just get discharged for punching a corporal in the face. He's a f***ing asshole. Don't they then have to go to, like, uh, court-martial and then spend... Like, if you have to do national service and you get out of it by punching your superior officer in the face, surely you then have to go to prison for the term of your uh, national service, right? I mean, otherwise, what's the point? Once they'd made their escape, they assaulted a police officer, were arrested, and earned the distinction of being the last prisoners to be held in the Tower of London. No way, famous old British prison. I think now a tourist attraction. They spent the entirety of their service either in the stockade or on the run during one of their repeated escapes, and they were far from model prisoners, burning their bedding, assaulting guards, and generally raising hell. Yeah, look, if you escape from prison, you're not a model prisoner, are you? Once they were dishonorably discharged, they transferred to a civilian prison to serve out the rest of their sentences. On their last night of service, they spent the evening drinking cider and smoking cigarillos that they charmed out of the young conscripts who were guarding them. This duality, senseless violence, and winning charisma was to characterize their later careers yeah it's a scary combination someone who's like your absolute best friend super charming hey how you doing mate but then will absolutely slay you with no moral hold up now just before we get back into today's video i do want to say that it's brought to you by the fine people over at surfshark helping you get the most out of your internet experience look the internet's come a long way in the past i don't know 25 30 years at least that's how long i've been using it back in the day you didn't have to worry so much about going into starbucks firing up your wi-fi logging into your internet banking only to find out that you've logged on to what's not starbucks wi-fi but someone's fake honeypot wi-fi and they've, they've stolen all i don't know look there's cyber criminals out there doing cyber criminally type stuff and you can stay safe by using a vpn it encrypts all of that internet traffic so you can communicate with your bank without someone getting in between you know that's not a good thing when someone gets in between you can protect yourself with surfshark look all of that is well and good but for me surfshark mostly about allegedly expanding my uh streaming options but if you fire up surfshark and then open up netflix and you've jumped over to some other country or another streaming service or whatever you're going to find out that there are a whole lot of other options for you to watch the example i always bring up is the mission impossible movies i've said this before i wanted to watch mission impossible i was logged into american netflix none of them were available i actually turned off surfshark vpn and then i logged into netflix with my local uh, prague czech republic netflix accounts and all of the mission impossible movies were there so if you're in america thinking i've got everything on netflix try coming over here and you'll find out you got those mission impossible movies and uh, well tons of other stuff if you're near the end of your netflix queue surfshark is going to sort you out also totally unlimited so you're not going to be watching a movie and they're going to be like ah that's all the data you get there it's unlimited there are no logs of course not it's a vpn it's all about privacy and there's also a 30-day money back guarantee if you do not like it but why wouldn't you like it go to surfshark.deals forward slash criminalist for 83 percent off and three months for free and now back to today's video the grim brothers and london crime when people talk about the craze they generally say ronnie and reggie despite reggie being the eldest and spending more time in charge of the gang probably the main reason is that ronnie was always far more committed to the idea of being a gangster and all that went with it he reveled in violence necessary or otherwise was the driving force behind their iconic image the sharp suits and the narrow ties and was throughout his entire life someone who wanted to be a purveyor of regal largesse it seems an essential part of ronnie's happiness to be able to scatter coins and gifts among the lowly and the favored he once racked up seven thousand pound tab at harrods while incarcerated mostly spent on luxuries and gifts for his boy toys this was another attention grabbing feature of ronnie's the fact that he was openly gay at a time when homosexuality was illegal interestingly some cray confidants say that both ronnie and reggie were gay initially but that reggie went straight so to speak later it's also noteworthy that the women who married ronnie who came out as bisexual in the 1980s when both brothers were serving life sentences had begun courting reggie additionally an unconfirmed and somewhat dubious report says that reggie's first wife who committed suicide was found to be a virgin at the post-mortem for me though their sexuality is the least interesting part of the story except where it intersects with their criminal careers and it was a criminal career that they deliberately set out to pursue their past convictions making it impossible for them to continue boxing and their and especially ronnie's grand ambitions of making a life of humble employment untenable wait why can't you box if you've been a criminal i feel like that's one of the careers that could be open to you fighting <laughs> It's like you went to prison. Sorry, mate, you can't be a boxer. What? I guess maybe professional, like they wouldn't let you compete in tournaments or something like that. Still a bit weird, though, isn't it? 
Once they'd got out of prison after their glorious military careers, they found their little patch of the East End unchanged. Brother Charlie had been invalided out of the Navy with migraines, probably from boxing, and had married his childhood sweetheart. He was living in a family home, had converted the boxing gym back to a bedroom, and was working with his dad in the family business. The twins moved back in as well, and with a small loan from Charlie, brought a run-down snooker hall in Marl Ends. This they deliberately set out to turn into a den of iniquity. Ronnie loved the movie gangster aesthetic and would even go around the snooper club, snooper club handing out cigarettes saying, Smoke up, it's not smoky enough in here. They also let it be known that if there was dodgy business to be done, theirs was a safe place to do it, so long as you were willing to throw a percentage to the house, of course. This sounds like risky but profitable. I mean, according to like our rules of crime this is like i'd say uh, pretty smart like normally we're like we cover so many people who are doing crimes for like super low amounts of money or super high risk stuff with very little reward this seems like relatively low risk relatively high reward so so far i mean the craze terrible people as we will find out um kind of terrible people already uh but also good criminals it's worth talking a little bit here about how London crime worked back then. In the decades prior, there had been a certain type of London wrong and sharply dressed and willing to dabble in everything from black market goods to armed robbery. During and just after the war, these were called spivs, and they evolved into teddy boys. Which is, like, the least threatening thing ever. A teddy boy sounds like a kid who can't, is too attached to his teddy and carries it around with him. <clears throat> like a teddy bear. And then finally into the famous mods and rockers who i've heard of aren't they the ones who put loads of mirrors on their bikes like they had these uh scooters like vespers and stuff and one of these would have like tons of mirrors on them which is like that's a weird trend isn't it i think it was something about the police saying that they had to have mirrors and so they were like F you police we're gonna have like a hundred mirrors which is weird and very teenagery sort of rebellion after this, American criminal archetypes began to dominate the scene, but it's worth remembering that until the 60s or thereabouts, it was in fact the British Empire which occupied the cultural, economic, and artistic space where the USA sits today, and London was its beating heart. They were drawing on a long tradition of English criminality and combining it with new American influences to craft their image. Yeah, like the sharp suits and thin ties is something I definitely associate with more American gangsters. Like, I feel like even like gangsters in the UK I associate with tracksuits. <laughs> not like sharp ties i mean maybe that's more accurate even in america today but like that old school image of a gangster i don't imagine i'm like wearing suits anymore which is weird regardless of outer trappings english organized crime during this period was loosely divided between mobs and firms mobs did armed robbery and it was during the 50s and 60s that this particular crime reached epidemic proportions with the world famous flying squad being formed specifically to combat it firms on the other hand were more the business administration side of the coin they were almost exclusively concerned with tips and commissions sometimes selling information to the mobs collecting a percentage of the takings and also conducting illegal gambling long firms and there's a note here a long firm is a type of scam where a reputable business is established or taken over and run rail for a period of time to establish the trust of the suppliers they then make a series of massive orders sell up all the stock at bargain bracement prices and then disappear sometimes the proprietor will take the wrap in exchange for a lump sum payment or forgiveness of debt other times all officers of the company will disappear without a trace okay so it's kind of like a con job it's also worth noting just how little conception the public and the police force had of organized crime they knew it existed of course but they had next to no idea how to deal with it or even how it operated this sounds ridiculous today but at the time england's police forces were municipality controlled and they still are with little or no intelligence being shared between boroughs and much and much of networks and organized crime was invisible to law enforcement ronnie and reggie were very much on the firm side of things they in fact ended up calling their outfit the firm a somewhat arrogant statement of their intent to become the only game in town they started working for some of the most famous firms in London, became embroiled in a falling out between Billy, the Billy Hill Gang and Jack Spot Coma, the two kingpins of gangland at the time. This flames out with Spot retiring to become a furniture salesman and Billy Hill going to join all the other superannuated British gangsters living in villas in Spain. The resultant power vacuum was initially filled by an Italian gang operating out of a social club on the Clerkenwell Road. Rumors abounded that these Italians had a vendetta with the craze, so Ronnie went round there one night, fired three shots at them without hitting anyone, and walked out. This was apparently sufficient to cement their early reputation, and Ronnie is said to have declared, We're not playing kids' games anymore. Mythical Beasts of Clubland 
with the snooker hall bringing in good money and the twins frantically self-promoting as the kings of london they were soon in a position to buy a nightclub which they called the double r for reggie and ronnie it's worth pointing out just how bleak england was in the immediate post-war period rationing endured for many years after the war making fertile ground for black marketeers and late night drinking was illegal as was most gambling and of course prostitution and most drugs yeah the like the war was it was super grim for the economy and you can see like there's a big post-war buildings in london and it's like they're all ugly as sin just concrete blocks and also like where buildings were bombed out it'll be like you get a row of really nice looking houses and there'll be one house that is just ugly as sin like it just looks like the other house is just much worse and you'll be like oh yeah that was bombed in the war and then turned into something shit after the war you know nice this created an opportunity for edgy operators to fill the market's demand for these commonplace pastimes, and with the staged legalization of gambling over the course of the 20th century, 50s London's became the Las Vegas of its day. Given the money involved, police corruption, especially in big cities, was rampant to the point of it being ridiculous. Unfortunately, records on police corruption at this time are sealed until 2037, so we'll have to wait for hard information, but there's plenty of anecdotal evidence in the meantime. Why is that sealed? I feel like police corruption is something that should be aired. Is there a reason? I mean, I'm sure there's a reason to keep it sealed. Otherwise, it wouldn't be sealed, would it? But I do wonder what that reason is. Maybe protecting people who are still alive and testified against corrupt police? That could be it, to protect witnesses. Okay, that makes sense. And then maybe by 2037, anyone who they'll be all dead because it's like 100 years or 80 years ago. 70 uh, years ago. The Crays were neck deep in all these trades, either taking a slice or operating the rackets themselves. More than anything, the Crays were a public relations phenomenon. They had a long list of celebrities visit their clubs, including Barbara Windsor, Frank Sinatra, George Raft, Peter Sellers, Lisa Minnelli, Judy Garland, Liza Minnelli, sorry, Judy Garland, Shirley Bassey, and that utter prick, Jimmy Savile, and more. Ronnie was known to revel in just how easy it was to get celebrities to socialize with them. The Crays also had significant political connections with Tory Pierce. Lord Boothby, who was in fact the senior Tory in the House of Lords on the one hand, and Tom Dryberg, a prominent and basically openly gay Labour MP on the other. I mean, yeah, if you're, if basically post-war, all fun has been taken away, and you're a celebrity, or you're rich, and it's like, I want to gamble, and I want to do all this fun sh and I want to drink, and I don't like the fact that I can't eat as much steak as I want. And some criminal is like, hey, I'm open. I got this place where you can come, and it's just like, we got all of this shit, and it's expensive. And you're like, good news, money is not a concern. And then you can see why this became popular, and why they managed to hobnob with all these famous people, because they had something that they wanted. This connection was so sensitive that it repeatedly hampered Scotland's Yard, Scotland Yard's attempts to investigate the brothers. It was a scandal involving Lord Boothby, where Daily Mail crime reporter Norman Lucas outed Ronnie as both a criminal and a gay lover of Boothby, which contributed significantly to the craze's national and social profile. The Mirror published the story, leaning heavily on the homosexual angle, of course they did, and were subsequently sued by Lord Boothby, who was awarded £50,000 in damages, which is a lot of money back in the day. It's a lot of money now. Maybe ten times as much? Maybe even more? It's rumored that anywhere between five grand and the whole lot of this settlement went to the craze. On a side note, it seems much more likely that the relationship between Ronnie and these pillars of society was based around procuring young men for their amusements. Oh my. And on top of all of this, the craze did what most East End gangsters do when it comes to burnishing the old image, and they became prominent philanthropists, organizing charity events at their clubs, and generally living at large for the paps. This seems risky. Like, if you're some, like, criminal, I feel like the best criminals are the ones we don't know about. Like, we all think about Pablo Escobar and, you know, famous criminals. The best criminals are the ones that are not famous. I guess the problem is you get rich, and you're like, well, I want to spend this money. And then someone's like, well, who's this random guy who doesn't seem to have any business? Why is he buying, like, a hundred million dollar house in, like some random location and then it's like well that's going to draw some attention someone's going to look into it it's like oh he's a drug kingpin or some shit. so i guess at some point you can't avoid it but i feel like people there's probably criminals out there who do absolutely avoid it and have no public profile and just like have a scrooge mcduck style money vault <laughs> It wasn't all stout champagne and stars, however. Away from the tabloids' cameras, Reggie was the less social and more calculating of the two, and it seems he was also less deluded. From all we can make out, it seems Reggie's greatest ambition in life was something known then as possession. We'd say respectability. He appears to have wanted desperately to own a family home, have a wife and kids, and be generally respected and acknowledged to society. Well, mate, 
if that's what you wanted, it's a lot easier than running a giant criminal enterprise. And uh, you've gone really hard in the wrong direction. To this end, he harried a 16-year-old girl named Frances Elsie Cher into marrying him and then promptly sold the rights to cover the wedding. That doesn't sound like you want like a nice family and house, so you marry a 16-year-old who you badger into marrying you. That sounds f***ing awful. Is that even legal? Their married life together lasted a total of eight weeks until Francis fled both Reggie's possessiveness and the realities of a life of crime. The marriage limped along for a while, conducted bizarrely through the window of her parents' house, okie doke, before she finally attempted suicide twice at the age of 23, first by gas, presumably an oven, and then successfully through a barbiturate overdose. Francis's funeral was a tabloid sensation, and the craze were made, made quite a package, selling the rights to that too. That is the most... Mm, that is an unpleasant thing to do. Both brothers continued to be recklessly violent, especially Ronnie, who was slowly losing his mind. Some reporters trace this mental instability to the twins contracting diphtheria at the age of three, but I have my doubts. In any case, Ronnie, after one of his many random violent incidents, was sentenced to a prison term during which he was so troublesome he was certified insane and sent to a mental institution. He hated it there, missing both the lavish prison lifestyle he'd been able to sustain and deeply offended by the stigma of being considered nuts lavish prison lifestyle i mean even if you're rich in prison and you've got like money to buy shit, it's still prison <laughs> what we do know is that ronnie was a paranoid schizophrenic a difficult and subtle diagnosis which the health system at the time didn't pick up on there's an amusing story about how ronnie got out of hospital reggie and francis arranged to visit bringing along the aforementioned norman lucas the journalist who was busy ingratiating himself with the twins to get a story and in his own words expose them the craze kept a close correspondence with journalists and publicists of all kinds being at least as interested in staying in the limelight as they were in the crime business reggie wore a fawn raincoat over his sharp suit and they all met in a visiting room Wait, so he's like wearing a suit in the... Wait, no, Ronnie was in hospital. Sorry, Reggie comes to visit. Um, residents weren't allowed to leave the room, but visitors could. So with a quick switcher of the raincoat, identical twin Ronnie was able to step out and make a cup of tea. Norman Lucas says, Eventually, we drove away in quite a hurry, I thought, and I turned to what I thought was Reggie and said, So how do you feel Ronnie is holding up? He turned back to me and said, I am Ronnie, you f***ing idiot. Later, Norman was able to negotiate a deal with the home office where Ronnie would give himself up with no penalties, a maneuver which allowed him to avoid spending further time in the hospital, allowing him to serve out the rest of his sentence in a regular prison. Man, you know mental hospital is bad, when it's like, I'd just rather be in regular prison. <laughs> when they were at the height of their career, Nipper Reed, by now one of the Met's youngest inspectors and a generally excellent operator, was intensively investigating the craze. He was hampered not only by the East End Code of Silence, but also by the random, almost manic pattern of the craze expansion. They were involved in a dizzying number of rackets, from the protection racket, which their celebrity made much easier, to jewel smuggling scams, stolen car rackets, gambling, and murder and maiming for hire. There were now a couple of dozen hard nuts in the firm, and they were beginning to set their sights well beyond the tiny triangle of London known as the East End, which was, in reality, all the territory they ever controlled. They were meeting with representatives of the Genovese crime family, the most prominent of the American mafia families at the time, as well as investing in businesses and nightclubs at a dizzying rate. They'd also hooked up with a mysterious man named Alan Cooper, a banker and gold smuggler who was seeking protection from the Richardson gang, their principal rivals south of the River Thames. Roy, afraid that his American counterparts weren't taking him seriously enough, decided in his Ronnie way that what they needed was a series of high-profile assassinations. Alan Cooper introduced him to a hitman, who turned out not to be a hitman, and they hatched a plan to assassinate Maltese club owner and rival George Karuna with a car bomb, which was all the rage at the time. Cooper hired a cutout to procure the explosives, but Nipper Reed had Cooper under constant surveillance and was able to intercept the shipment. Nipper brought Cooper in and threatened to charge him, only to find out that the banker claimed to be working for Scotland Yard. It seemed that Cooper was a U.S. Treasury asset, tasked with uncovering the extent of Cray's involvement with, the, with government figures such as Lord Boothby. Wait, what's the American government doing... This is confusing. It's important to stress that this is just a rumor, but Cooper's story stinks to high heaven of undercover work and is probably a video of its own, or would be if there was any reasonable prospect of finding out anything important about him. So maybe we can table that one. Until 2037. <laughs> Decline and fall. 
The question may well be asked, if the craze was so untouchable, so well in with high society, why was Nipper Reed so hot on their trail? Well, I mean, there's gonna be some guy. You are, It's like a trope in movies almost. It's like, they've got ins, all the police are corrupt, but there's one guy. And he's gonna be the guy who like breaks everything open and he risks his own life. And maybe there's a journalist involved as well. He's also risking his own. The movie basically writes itself at this point. And it did. There are many movies about the craze. Well, the answer is their untouchability was basically a figment of their own self-marketing. They'd both spent significant stints in prison through their roughly 10-year reign of the East End, and they were both constantly in legal trouble under investigation, contesting or losing criminal trials. What made it difficult to land a major, literally gangbusting conviction against them had much more to do with how criminal investigation worked at the time rather than anything else. Yeah, it's like these guys are being super obvious about the crime. They're, everyone knows they're criminals. It's like, dudes... You know, you're breaking several rules there. It's like, you're gonna get, someone's gonna catch up to you eventually. And they do! With crime, organized or otherwise, police rely heavily on informants. This is still true today, but in the digital age, informants are supplanted by digital surveillance, especially when it comes to organized crime. In Australia in 2013, for example, 90% of drug trafficking convictions originated from mobile telephony intercepts. Back in the 20th century, however, it was informants or it was nothing. And in the case of East London, these were very few and far between. Nipper Reed tells the story of a time when he and the, he had both the craze in custody on a trumped-up charge, sort of a convict Al Capone of tax evasion gambit, which relied on the testimony of a female witness who had begged the police to arrest the twins and save her life. According to Nipper, when she heard they'd been arrested, she dropped to her knees and hugged his legs in gratitude. And yes, that's a completely platonic gesture, you degenerates. In any case, Nipper sold her. In any case, Nipper told her to come back the next day to testify. Well, that was a mistake, Nipper said in a Granada interview, because she comes back the next day resplendent in furs and jewels, saying, I've come to stand bail for my good friends, the craze. If you think this is a bribe, you're absolutely right. Oh, wow. So not only are they getting away with it, but they are sending a message with that. The firm, safe and strong in their East End community, had got to her. So strong were the walls of this shadow state that the murder of Cornell and the blind beggar, which we mentioned at the start of today's video, wasn't sufficient to bring about their demise. It was another killing of a straight-up psycho known as Jack the Hat McVitie, which would eventually bring about their downfall. Early in the formation of the firm, Reggie had picked up a man called Leslie Payne. Payne was a savvy and intelligent operator who was instrumental in the expansion of the firm in the early 60s. Left to themselves, the twins were little more than violent thugs. It was Payne who encouraged them to expand into clubs and rackets, and who's generally acknowledged as the only reason the firm ever made any money in the early days at all. By 1966, however, the twins' random acts of violence and lunacy alarmed him enough to break with the firm. By 1967, Ronnie had murdered Cornell, and Reggie, having a bit of a breakdown after the suicide of his first wife, came to believe Payne was about to grass on him. He engaged Jack the Hat McVitie, so-called because he was balding and always wore a hat, even in the bath reputedly, to cover it. He offered McVitie somewhere between 500 to 1,000 pounds to kill Payne, paying 100 to 500 pounds in advance, depending on who you believe. That's not... Wait, <laughs> that's pretty cheap to murder someone who is involved in gang stuff. I'm not a smart man. Now, McVitie was a bit of a disorderly chap, a psychopathically violent alcoholic and drug addict, far from the Hollywood vision of a cold professional hitman. He was, in fact, more like a builder in that he accepted the job and then simply failed to carry it, carry it out. Yeah, I don't think that Hollywood depiction of hitmen is particularly accurate. It's always like super professional, like no emotions, highly paid. Whereas I think the reality is like more hitmen are just like desperate for money, lacking in morals, probably going to get caught. And the problem is if they get caught, they're definitely going to roll over on whoever hired them for a reduced sentence, right? It seems that up till this point, the craze had never personally killed anyone. After Ronnie shot Cornell in the pub, he rushed back to Reggie saying, I shot him. I actually shot him. This made both Ronnie and Reggie start thinking they should both make their bones, so to speak. So they decided to start with McVitie, who wasn't only indebted to them, but was reportedly going around town bragging about taking money from those nonces. They arranged to have Chris and Tony Lambriano, who enforces for the firm and friends of McVitie, to get him drunk at the Carpenter's Arms, and then invite him to a party at a house in Eversham Road, which belonged to a couple who worked for the firm. When Jack arrived, he found only the craze and a random assortment of Ronnie's boys and residents of the house. Uh-oh. <laughs> the only thing that could make this worse is if there's a tarp laid down on the floor, and then you're like, f**k. 
<laughs> Shouldn't have come to this party. The twins took Mavitti to a basement where Reggie attempted to shoot him, but the pistol jammed. A scuffle ensued, during which Ronnie managed to get a hold of Jack, and Reggie stabbed him multiple times in the face and abdomen. Finally, pinning him to the floor, he delivered a stab wound to the neck. Ronnie and Reggie didn't seem to have much an idea what to do next, and they roused the whole firm, as well as some random hanger-ons, to get the place cleaned up and dispose of the body. Chris Lambriano was one of the ones who helped. He late had a prison epiphany, became a born-again Christian, and ended up running a charity for recovering addicts, but that's by the by. The murder of McVitty turns their community against the twins. Already by this time, their high profile and random violence led many members of the firm to see the twins as a bit of a liability, and it is believed that they had, if they had a been arrested, they would have been murdered anyway. But the killing of McVitie led many to fear for their own safety, especially Leslie Payne, who, aware of the contract on his life, promptly went to Nipper Reed. Ironically, Reggie's decision to come over all mafioso and tie up loose ends pushed the man who knew exactly where all the bodies were buried into the arms of the police, and pretty well the whole firm was in the dock before very long. Yo, if you can't if there's a guy who knows all of your secrets, he knows all of your criminal activities, he's immensely valuable to the police. You just have to, you can't like let him find out. If you've thought about killing him, keep your mouth shut until you've actually killed him. Because otherwise, even if he starts sensing that you might want to kill him, he's going to go to the police because <laughs> he has so much information. And he knows that he's an extreme danger if you think that you might be thinking you're going to kill him. If he thinks you think that he, you see what I mean, right? The trial was a media circus helped along by Ronnie and Reggie's insatiable appetite for publicity, and by the end, the twins had been found guilty of the murders of George Cornell and Jack McVitty and sentenced to 30 years' imprisonment. Wrap up. The legacy of the craze has had a revival recently, thanks to the film Legend starring Tom Hardy as both twins. In the years, in fact decades, following their imprisonment, however, they were an absolute sensation. They set up several businesses, and it's believed merchandise sales alone were netting them £3,000 a week. Holy sh Many of their close associates, including Chris Lambriano, said the craze made a hell of a lot more money selling mugs, t-shirts, and television rights than they ever did as criminals. I mean, I find that extremely doubtful. £3,000 a week is a lot of money. But if you're running a criminal enterprise and you're only making £3,000 a week, even back in the 60s, uh, you're making an error. You should be making more money than that for the risk you're taking on. They seem to have done better personally in prison as well. Reggie became a fitness fanatic and was continually calling journalists and publicists to advertise books that he was publishing about exercise when he wasn't being paid to write and talk about his past life, that is. And Ronnie was married twice in Broadmoor, once to a graduate called Elaine Milder in 1985, and then, and then again to Kate Howard, an ex-kissogram girl in 1990. That's the woman who was my na nan's neighbor. <laughs> Apart from the obligatory craze book, which she and everybody else who knew them wrote, possibly Kate Howard's most interesting fact is that she used to live next door to Simon's nan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I, uh, I, I was talking to Chris about this before, and I was like, Chris, I'm not sure if this is and then I looked it up, and I was like, holy sh**. There you go. Ronnie died in 1995 of heart trouble, unsurprising for a man who smoked 100 cigarettes a day. Charlie died five years later, and Reggie died of bladder cancer shortly after. Reggie passed his... There's the <laughs> so, Reggie... Uh, lived five years longer than Ronnie. And Ronnie smoked a hundred cigarettes a day while Reggie was a fitness fanatic. That, I, know it's, I know it's five years and it's a lot of life, but it does suck. <laughs> Death is just another path, one that we almost take. No sh that's Sorry, interesting. But he's like, yeah, I just got five more years and you are smoking five packets of cigarettes a day. Crazy. Reggie passed his final weeks in the company of his second wife, Roberta Jones, in the honeymoon suite of a Norwich hotel. It's telling that Ronnie's funeral was better attended than Winston Churchill's, a fact seen by some as a sad indictment of celebrity culture, and by me as proof positive that to be a true hero of the people, it's important to be a criminal. <laughs> that being said, it's clear. That is bizarre. That being said, it's clear that so much of the craze myth is exactly that. It's a myth. Researching this piece, I've been mired in rumor exaggeration, nostalgia, and outright fabrication laid out by what seems to be a whole generation determined to remember these two thugs kindly. The picture that's emerged from me, however, is of two confused and none too bright wannabes who almost achieved a successful criminal career through some good luck and a whole lot of terrorism, but who ultimately were brought undone through their own weirdly childish vileness. Yeah, I think that's it. I don't know. Maybe it's maybe i'm not of the generation that was brought up knowing the craze and stuff i mean of course i know who the craze were but there was definitely i don't think there's any romanticizing in my generation of these guys and reading this and i've also made a biographics video about them which is a youtube channel that i do another one um 
I just feel like they seem like really unpleasant people. They just were unpleasant people who were born into like a rough environment and they just continued to be unpleasant and tried to run a gang that wasn't even that successful. Simple. But they were really good at PR. Dismembered Appendices Number one, one of the businesses run by the Crays in prisons was in prison was Crayley Enterprises, a security company. Crayley provided 18 bodyguards for Frank Sinatra's 1985 England visit. How are you running a company like this in prison? Do they really let you do that in prison? That seems pretty crazy. Number two, constant campaigns to have the Crays released were run by both the Cray family and justice campaigners. In those days, a life sentence was somewhere between 10 and 20 years. For context, a man who shot three policemen in the street was sentenced to a lesser term than the Crays. How is that guy not in prison forever? You shot three policemen. What the f***? This anomaly led to many saying that the greatest victim of the Cray trial was the reputation of the law, as the sentence seemed vindictive. Yeah, but this is like the Al Capone thing, isn't it? It's like, we know you did a bunch of other crimes, so we're going to absolutely throw the book at you for this murder one, right? Which I, is not justice. It's not how it should work. I'm saying, like, sometimes that's just how it has to work, but I don't really think that's right. I think, cr- yeah, I don't really think that's okay, to be honest. So, yeah, changing my mind on that one. Uh, number three, the Cray's trial was the longest and most expensive criminal proceeding in the history of the country to that time. Holy sh! Number four, a huge number of Cray associates made their nest eggs writing books or giving interviews on the twins. One of the last of these, Ronnie's friend Laurie O'Leary, tells how Ronnie summoned him to prison to commission him to write his biography. Don't make me a nice person, Ronnie said. Just say I was nice to people and bastards to bastards. And that is where we wrap up this gangster themed episode or wannabe gangster theme. it's crazy to think that the craze who are kind of like famous gangsters were mostly wannabe gangsters these ain't some al capone motherfuckers. these are like they, they kind of just wanted to be and one of them didn't even really want to be anyway i don't remember which one because their names are so similar uh thank you for watching this episode of the country criminalist i do hope you enjoyed it if you're watching this on youtube there's a like button you can use if you fancy or a dislike button leave a comment blah 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 also if you're listening i'd love a review if you listen to this in its podcast form uh head on over to spotify they do ratings uh, apple podcast does reviews or google or wherever you get your shows there's usually that feature and thank you for watching and i'll see you soon